Okay, recording in progress. Now, now let's record for posterity our conversation. Uh, yeah, we are in the chapter about Mikva and her emphasis on election. And as I was just uh, saying before the recording started, the way she uh, organizes both chapters, uh, or all three chapters, I should say, is by, uh, first of all, introducing the idea of, of what election or chosenness uh, or, or, you know, or special treatment, you might say, has done, and then how it has manifested itself by emphasizing difference between us and them, and also uh, fueling conquest. And I, I was saying that her chapter section on conquest, I thought was um, pretty brief, you know, um, and somebody said, I think it may have been Constance, that she thought uh, that Mikva was, was kind of redundant. And, and I think that's the nature of what she's trying to do in that, um, boy, there's so much here. And, and every chapter is like an entire history lesson of yeah. 2,000 to 2,500 years. And I think in the expanse of that, we, we lose something especially if you're not familiar with some of the, the theology that she's referring to. So I am trying to fill in some of the, uh, you know, the, the missing pieces here. And I, I hope I'm not doing it in a way that, you know, I'm telling you things that you already know. Um, but anyway, but Will, uh, for the recording sake, do you want to mention what you just did about the uh, Manifest destiny. <laughs> well, I was just being sarcastic, of course. Yeah. That, you know, the idea of manifest destiny uh, and domination and uh, the native tribes being re educated. Right. All right. comes out of the idea of being chosen and elected. Right. <laughs> And that's the white man's burden, so to speak, which is usually refers to the British and in, in colonized Africa. But yeah, they know, did it too. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. And, yeah, and uh, that that is, I mean, it's a very good point. And this idea of domination um, is one that, all right, if you're elect, and then if you go back to the original. Uh, vocation of humans in the garden, which is to uh, be fruitful and multiply and have dominion, subdue the earth and have dominion uh, over you know, all of creation. Well, that idea of dominion was supposed to have some sacred overtones to it, right? In other words, be a good steward, but dominion, especially in our capitalist system that emphasizes, you know, increasing demand of uh, whether it's artificial demand or actual demand and, and increasing supply to meet demand, um, dominion very quickly becomes domination. And when we think about, you know, the way that natural resources have been used and uh, abused really for many years. And Kathy was just mentioning in Phoenix how water just seems to be seen as a luxury well these are people who are moving down from whether whether wisconsin or, or wherever the northeast you know the the so-called snowbirds uh and assuming that their ecology is has the same type of uh, uh carrying capacity that their ecology in ohio had right and well of course i can water my lawn <laughs> and all of these things um, oh, yeah. That, that idea of dominion is such that we've, we have not allowed ourselves to recognize the limitations of our ecological uh, habitat. And uh, to, our, to our detriment, we all know what happened about this you know, in the 1930s uh, on the Great Plains with the Dust Bowl. Uh, the idea, and boy, we could talk forever on this, <laughs> but, but the idea that rain would follow the plow, right? Oh, you know, no problem. You go out there in, in Western Nebraska, you just start pl plowing the ground. And because we are elect and because God has chosen us for this particular, you know, vocation on the earth to have dominion, you know, everything will fall in place. Well, you know, it certainly did not fall into place. So, um, so there is so much in this chapter that, you know, well, we could, we could talk about for quite some time. 
uh, and so much that we we have to answer for, really, especially to uh, ensuing or subsequent generations. So, any anyone else want to make a comment while I change my name from Damon to Dan Deffenbaugh? <laughs> uh, Dan, just, just jump on in. Yes, Dan. Uh, this morning on NPR, uh, a Native American uh, leader. Uh, was talking, was reflecting on, I think it's Idaho and Montana and Wyoming that are lifting the hunting ban on um, wolves. Wolf. And he made the comment, too many wolves and, oh, in our past, too many white people. <laughs> <laughs> Which are almost synonymous. Actually, it, no, they're not synonymous. The wolf is, uh, I think it was the Ojibwa they were talking about, the Chippewa where the wolf was the, is a, a sacred animal to them, you know, a spiritual brother. And, and the, white, the white settlers would be uh, more of the reviled and uh, uh, wolves, we might say, the ones that are rapacious and, you know, all of those things that we've attributed through our othering onto the wolf uh, itself. Uh, boy, a wonderful book on this, if you ever, get an opportunity to read it and it's i've got a friend now who's got a little cabin down around red cloud and he 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 gave me the task of of creating a library of only 10 books if you could have only 10 books in your library <laughs> what would they be <laughs> well i mean that's quite a task right <laughs> but one of those books whenever i'm asked that question you know like like greg getting asked what his favorite verse is uh the, the book is always, it's called Of Wolves and Men by uh, Barry Lopez. And it's a wonderful natural history, a wonderful social history, a wonderful, you know, um, I guess, specific history of, of wolves and their, um, and their social structure. Uh, something that I read, I think I was still in college when I read it and I thought, oh, wow, this is such good writing. If you know Lopez's work, uh, very good, but he he is one who, at least implicitly in his writing, uh, tries to point out, especially in this book, what the consequences of manifest destiny and this presumed Christian election uh, have been in our history. And um, you know the way that the wolves were were eradicated through strychnine poisoning. That whole idea of, of dominion, you know, by killing an animal in the most heinous way possible. I guess strychnine is a, a terribly painful process upon dying. It doesn't happen instantly. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a very good book. And I don't even know if it's readily available anymore, but it was written, I think, in the late 70s of Wolves and Men. So, um, yeah, thanks for that, Denny. Uh, any other comments? since we're just kind of on a free for all right now. Sharon has joined us. Glad your computer is working now, Sharon. Well, let's remind ourselves where we've been. We've been talking about Christian election and uh, you know, the consequences of that. Remember how Mikva sets up her chapters. It's, it promotes difference, you know, uh, that allows for othering uh, of people outside of the, the, the fold, so to speak. And it also usually results in some form of conquest, justifiable conquest, what we've been talking about. And we talked about last week uh, the way that certain New Testament texts lent themselves uh, to this idea of, of othering the Jews um, right, right from the very start. And uh, really, it probably begins with Paul. Uh, and, and Paul and I, I wanted to talk about his letter to the Galatians, uh, but there are other references. We talked about Johannine Christianity and their context when the Gospel of John was being written. They, the Johannine Christians, were being persecuted by the Jews. So it's only a matter of uh, course, you would say, in, you know, to see a rather anti-Jewish orientation in the Gospel of John. It's in the Gospel of John where Jesus is the harshest against the Jews, 
well, this reflects not so much the words and the, the actions and thoughts of Jesus as it does uh, reflecting um, the person writing in that you know, early second century context, uh, a Christian being persecuted by the more dominant at the time uh, synagogues. But all of that uh, uh, was quickly going to change. Uh, the one letter that Paul wrote that is probably the most um, significant in terms of what it does to separate Christians from Jews, uh, again, we have to come back to context, that matrix that was so important to, in our previous book. But it's Paul's letter to the Galatians. Um, and it's in this letter where we have this verse that Mikvah refers to, what does scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave shall not inherit the son of the free, uh, inherit with the son of the free man, uh, woman. The story is a reference to uh, Ishmael and Isaac. Uh, Ishmael presumably being, according to the Jewish tradition, the uh, illegitimate son of Abraham. Now, in, in the Muslim tradition, that's going to be quite different. Uh, why, why would Paul say something like this, especially when we know that when Paul is writing in his letter to the Romans, especially in chapters 9 through 11, he has a very special uh, orientation towards the role that the Jews play in, in God's salvation history. But it comes back to context. What was happening in Galatia when uh, Paul was writing his letter? Uh, and the letter would have been written sometime around 48 to 52 of the Common Era, um, one of Paul's earliest letters. At that time, Galatia, the Galatian churches were a series of churches that occupy Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, uh, they, uh, it was not written to a specific church, but to a group of churches. And in this group of churches, there would be itinerant preachers who would come by. Uh, among those preachers were those who were pro probably more representative of what we call Jewish Christianity. The idea, you know, we can see this in especially the Gospel of Matthew and uh, some of the sources in Matthew that Jesus was a good observant Jew. And the question came up in Galatia, hey, you know, if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to be baptized in, into Christ, then do you first need to become Jewish? And of course, the real question for the men in, in the congregation was, do I need to get myself circumcised? which you know, is probably <laughs> never the best marketing ploy <laughs> for, <laughs> for uh, you know, a growing religion. And there were some preachers in, uh, that were coming to the churches of Galatia and saying, by all means, yes, you must become a Jew before you become a Christian. And Paul wanted to put an end to that. And this is where Paul begins thinking about, okay, what, what does it mean, you know, uh, to become one in Christ when you're baptized? Is that through the first covenant and then into the second covenant? Or does the second covenant of baptism uh, uh, and, and the forgiveness of sins, does that somehow negate or replace the first covenant that God makes with the Jews through the law. So Paul has this really difficult task on his hands, and he errs on the side of the Gentile converts. He errs on the side of the probably larger number of Gentile converts in the Galatian churches. So Paul says, the law, there's no longer, and this is one of my favorite verses, and I, I'm so grateful to Mikvah for pointing out how this is, has a dark side to it. Uh, but what shall we say, Paul says, there is no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male and female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. So as if to say, you no longer have to be Jewish to, to follow Christ. You know, this is this is opening the doors of the covenant to the Gentiles without having to pass go or pay $200, you know. You don't have to become Jewish. You can immediately become a Christian. 
Um, that sets the groundwork then for othering the Jews, right? Oh, well, now we can skip past them. So remember what Mikva says is that you know, we tend to other those who are most like ourselves. Thus begins the, 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 the uh, distinction in the church between Jews and Christians. And it won't be long until those Jewish followers of Jesus that we'll call Jewish Christians, it won't be long until their church and their uh, you know, uh, whole emphasis upon following the Jewish law dies out. But we still see in the New Testament vestiges, we might say, or uh, remnants of this Jewish Christianity in the, the book of, in the letter to the Hebrews, for example, or the letter of, of James. Um, there's this conflict going on. And so I wanted to make, uh, I wanted to fill in that background on Galatians because, you know, uh, Mikva goes over, over rather quickly. Uh, but it won't be long, of course, that the Jews are seen as the Ishmaelites, right? Those who are outside of the fold. Um, so any, any questions or comments about that? And Dan, just to clarify, uh, when you refer to John, you're talking about John of Patmos, right? No, thank you. I'm talking about the Gospel of John. So in the Gospel of John, but that's a, it's a good question because you might remember John of Patmos uh, was also what we might call a Judaizer. He had a very strong affinity towards the Jewish nature of, of Christianity and, and thus writing his letter to the churches. He was, uh, you know, asking them to guard against, you know, falling into the sinfulness of, of the pagans. And he probably wasn't a, a good uh, supporter of Paul. But if you read the gospel, the gospel of John, which was written by somebody different, we used to think that John of Patmos and the gospel writer were the same person. But if we read the gospel of John, we see throughout the whole narrative of Jesus' life that the um, the ant antagonism or the antipathy between the Jews and Jesus is strongest there. That's where Jesus calls them actually the children of the devil, uh, which unfortunately uh, only serves to influence you know, later generations. Um, so any other questions about that? This is, oh, go ahead. Recently, I just, uh ran across the passage where uh, the Jews take Jesus out to throw him over the cliff and, right. uh, and then doesn't. Uh, uh, <clears throat> that, uh, uh, which, which book is that in? Well, that's actually, that is, follows right on the heels of our lectionary passage from last Sunday, where okay. Jesus announces his ministry in the synagogue. And then he you know, says, I, I've been the spirit of I've been anointed to proclaim release to the pet captives and anointing of or, and the giving of sight to the blind and, and to announce the acceptable year of the Lord. And then what Jesus does after that, he gives a little sermon and he makes reference to the time of Elijah when, you know, all of the prophets of Baal were, were uh, you know, trying to kill Elijah and Elijah takes up with uh a widow, the widow of Zarephath, I think is what her name is, what she's referred to. And, and she lives up in the area of Tyre and Sidon, uh, the, the area of Lebanon today, which was known specifically as a Gentile region. And Jesus says, you know, in all of uh, Israel at the time, there were no Jews that were helping out Elijah. And so he went and God blessed this woman, this Gentile woman, the widow, for caring for Elijah. Now, what that suggested in Luke's passage is that Jesus was announcing his ministry as one that was open, not just for the Jews. That passage that said, you know, I've been anointed to proclaim release of the captives, giving of sight to the blind, that was supposed to be for, that was a, a, an Isaiah prophecy that was supposed to be intended for, you know, the, the Jew, the Jews, but the way Jesus um, interprets it is that this is a universal, 
the Gentiles now are open to the, um, the grace of God. That's what gets him almost thrown off the cliff. <laughs> and this is in Luke chapter four, uh, starting around maybe verses 18 or 19 or so. That's where he gives his little sermon and they're outraged, you know. Well, what kind of a Messiah is this who's going to, you know, wanting to hang out with Gentiles? And they're about to throw him off the cliff. And he, as the passage says, walks, you know, amongst them or between them uh, without any incident. Um, and a prophet's never welcome in his hometown. And so he says, uh, sorry for that long ex ex exposition, uh, Dwight. You want to say something more about that? Uh, no, no, that's fine. I, uh, uh, I'm a little foggy as to uh, where I picked it up, and it was uh, a couple weeks ago, I guess, at, uh, yeah. at uh, uh, Greg's uh, uh, group, right? Well, you know, I'm with Greg. This is one of my favorite passages as well, because it, because it does a number of things. It, first of all, proclaims Jesus as Messiah and proclaims the work of Jesus in the kingdom, as being that of liberation of the oppressed. I'm anointed to set free to the captives, to you know, give sight to the blind, and to proclaim the, the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of Jubilee, where all debts are uh, you know, forgiven, and people are all living in an egalitarian and uh, a, a grace, graceful way, you know, in gracious uh, relationships with each other. Uh, and then finally, that this was, you know, not just for a Jewish uh, congregation, but for, for all the world, this universalizing tendency. Um, so that's where we were last Sunday. And I understand Greg is going to be preaching on 1 Corinthians this Sunday. So I don't, uh, I don't know what uh, particular passage that is, but I'm sure it's going to be relevant to what we're studying. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Will. Oh, you're still muted. Uh, that uh, it's the, first I Corinthians, just, it's first th Corinth, Corinthians chapter 13, oh. verses one through 13. It's the one that ends the greatest of these is love. Well, there's another one of my favorites. Yeah. Wow. Just hitting on all cylinders this month, right there. <laughs> go ahead, Dwight. You were going to say? No, I was going, uh, since you said he, uh, he was. Uh, Silence. I was going to tell tell you that it was uh, uh, the famous love passage. Oh yeah, yeah, the wonder, a, a wonderful passage. So, well, let's let's move on. Um, how does this difference deepen? And I think we talked a little bit about this, but throughout the history of the church, uh, this creating a difference between the Christian insiders, the elect, and the outsiders. Uh, you know, had terrible consequences, especially after the uh, time of Constantine. Uh, there were some who preached something called apocatastasis, which means just simply universal salvation for all. Um, but they were few and far between, and, and later one of them, Origen, was uh, regarded as, as a heretic. Origen, who is probably one of the earliest or one of the most interesting early church fathers, uh, because he was very steeped in, in Greek philosophy. But this idea of universal salvation was quickly shunted aside because most likely Christianity was going to be used for political purposes to organize and to unify the kingdom or the empire of Constantine. Uh, all after the fall of Rome, it was, um, you know, just a matter of course before, you know, the Christian tradition, which by that time was very, very, you know, when we're talking about the end of the fourth century is very, very popular. Um, when Rome falls, Christianity is just laid right on top of the Roman, you know, uh, infrastructure, you might say. And now you've got a ready-made empire religion. And so you move from the colonized to the colonizers, as uh, Mikva points out. Um, and it's in that context that 
Christianity starts to really refine its theology as to what it means to be a believer and what it means to be reprobate. This is the time of the councils, starting with the Council of Nicaea, 325, where, uh, where really what, what they're doing is creating a political law, which is also a theological law. If you are going to be a member of you know, the Constantine's empire, you must believe this about God, and you must believe this about Jesus. You must believe this about the Holy Spirit. This is the place where the whole emphasis on the Trinity uh, comes to be uh, so important. Roughly between 325 and 5, 550 or so were a series of uh, councils uh, continue to refine the theology of the, um, of the Christian tradition to such an extent that now you've got a, a very Romanized political system, a very Hellenized theological system that has been informed primarily by Plato, right? And you remember the Jewish tradition tends to focus more on the particular revelation of God in history, whereas a more Hellenized Christian system is going to be very platonic, em emphasizing universalism, right? Well, if you're going to be in, in a universal empire, if you are going to be an insider, you're going to believe the way we tell you to believe because we have the corner in the market of truth. Well, that did not serve well for the Jews. And from there on out, um, reading allegorical readings of scripture came to just further uh, distinguish Jews from Christians. Um, and you're probably familiar with these. I think I've talked a little bit about this last time, but these so-called typologies uh, that in reading the Old Testament, we see prefigurations of everything that God was moving towards in the person of Christ. Probably the most famous of these is, uh, to, to be read allegorically, is um, Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac. You know, and, and it's, it, it's almost laid out for Christian theology. Here's Abraham who, who, who loves his son, his only issue, uh, his only um, chance at immortality of perpetuating his, his identity, his seed, right? And God tests Abraham saying, I want you uh, to show how much you love me by sacrif sacrificing your son. And Abraham believes that this is what God wants him to do, and it's accounted to him as righteousness. So Abraham nearly, as the, the, you know, the painting here shows, nearly sacrifices Isaac before an angel of the Lord comes and holds his hand, stays his hand, and uh, in the distance, you know, uh, there is a ram with its horns caught in the thicket, and, and that is seen as the uh, the substitute sacrifice for, for Isaac, uh, that God will provide the sacrifice. The question that Isaac keeps asking Abraham all the way up the hill, hey, dad, I see the knife and I see the, the rope and stuff. I mean, I mean, set aside the whole psychological trauma that this must create with a child, right? I see the rope, I, but where is, where, what are we going to sacrifice? And, you know, the, and the, dramatic irony is just dripping from the page, right? Uh, and, and Abraham says, well, God will provide the sacrifice. God will provide the sacrifice. And um, Abraham passes the test, but not after, you know, Isaac almost has his throat, you know, cut <laughs> from ear to ear. Um, this is seen as an allegory of, well, a prefiguration of what God would do sacrifice his only son on the altar uh, as a, you know, spill his blood as a, a offering for forgiveness uh, of sins. The ram whose, whose horns are caught in the thicket are a representative of the sacrifice that is going to be made at a, at a later time to demonstrate as Abraham loved his only son, 
God even loved his only son all the more because he was, he went through with the sacrifice. There was no ram caught in the thicket. There was no angel holding uh, the hand of, of God when it came time for Christ to be nailed to the cross. So these kinds of prefigurations now are going to be read in to the Old Testament. And I'm, I'm sure you know of others. You, you learn them from the day you go to Sunday school. So I, I want to stop and see if there are any that, that come to mind. This, you know, I, I've already hit upon the one that's probably the most, um, most common. Any Old Testament prefigurations of, of Christ that you're aware of? Uh, the Egyptian uh, uh, exile is uh, mimicked in the uh, in the New Testament story of their uh, spending go going off to Egypt for the uh, exile uh, when uh, when they are uh, killing the uh, uh, infants in Palestine. Right. right, and and even in Matthew, you have these fulfillments of prophecies that you know if you read the the verses in context, you think, where in the world are they getting that? But even Matthew, as he's writing that narrative, is already beginning to allegorize his understanding of the Old Testament, you know? And this, this only sets up the conditions for the possibility that, you know, of, of what we call replacement theology. The Old Testament, why do we call it an Old Testament? Well, we really shouldn't. I mean, I, it's been part of my life for however many years, right? And, and I really should be calling it the Hebrew Bible. But to call it the Old Testament suggests the supersessionism, right? Well, that, you know, that's past. Now we've got a new covenant, a new testament uh, that has been sealed in the blood of Christ and everything else that has gone before that. Well, that's just a preface to the story. Um, and this is what Mikvah wants to try to get away from. And what she's saying at the end of this chapter, you know, focus on the continued love of God and continued loving participation of God in creation, in the whole narrative of salvation, not on, you know, this idea that, you know, we are elect because we have accepted Christ and been baptized into Christ. Um, Others, you know, the crossing of the Red Sea, when Moses parts the Red Sea, that's supposed to be seen as a prefiguration of baptism, uh, for example. Um, Jesus in Matthew is, the way Matthew writes his narrative is seen and is portrayed as a new Moses. You know, when he gives the Sermon on the Mount, why is it on the Mount? Well, because Jews would see this, ah, oh, this is Moses speaking from the mountain very interesting that Luke calls it the Sermon on the Plain, Luke being a much more egalitarian and Gentile-oriented uh, New Testament uh, author. Um, the story, you know, the, the suffering servant, which in Isaiah was meant to be uh, a reference to the Jewish people themselves during the Babylonian captivity, and their suffering I believe Isaiah 53, they're suffering, uh, they have paid the cost, you know, uh, by his stripes we are healed, right? Uh, well, no, talk to anybody today and they will tell you very clearly if they're part of the church, oh, that's a, you know, that's a reference to Jesus. Uh -uh. <laughs> no, it wasn't. But do you see what we've done? We've put this Christian veneer over the whole Old Testament and made any other interpretation particularly one that's contextual, right? For getting, uh, establishing a meaning in the context for which it was written, that, that has, the Christian interpretation has made that obsolete or has made it, you know, completely invalid. Um, the church, by the way, prefigurations in the Old Testament of, of the church. Have you ever gone into our little chapel at First Pres? And, First of all, I love that little chapel, and I'm so sorry that we're not doing the Tuesday services there, but eventually, someday, we can go back in it. But next time you're there, look up to the ceiling and tell me what you see. You're going to be seeing something that seems out of place because you have all of this, you know, all of this concrete and very 
solid walls on both sides. But if you look up, you will see that the ceiling itself has wooden rafters. Those rafters, rafters represent Noah's Ark, that you as a participant <laughs> in the worship of Christ in this little chapel have been taken onto the ark. You have been saved from the, the, the storm raging without. If you go into uh, Mark's, St. Mark's uh, Episcopal Church, you'll say, see the same thing. It seems almost, you know, uh, anachronistic or uh, out of place that they've got this wooden uh, ceiling with rafters, but it's meant to offer a um, an illusion, if you will, a, 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 a very concrete illusion to, you know, Noah's Ark and being saved from the destruction uh, of the world out there. So a this lot of, a, go yeah, ahead. If I speak for a moment. Uh, <clears throat> this is very Augustinian. This is Augustinian uh, allegory, allegory. Right. And it was, uh, uh, you were urbane and part of the church and part of the uh, big, the real city. If you allegorized everything, and so that uh, you, you were encouraged and taught to do this kind of allegory, which comes into uh, uh, English literature, so that if you don't allegorize, you can't read Beowulf, you can't read Chaucer, you, can, uh, you maybe can begin to read Shakespeare, but we're not sure about that even. <laughs> and it's all, all of this coming out of the uh, allegorical traditions of the uh, very early church and and Judaism preceded uh, the church in doing this too as a matter of fact <clears throat> uh, Augustus gives us you ought to look for these four levels of meaning and everything right and uh, 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 there is an earlier Jewish uh, tradition you look for six levels of meaning and everything that, uh, correct right um, and that tradition continues in uh, interpretation of the Kabbalah as well. Uh, Pardes is what it's, is the acronym that uh, is referred to, but that's only for four levels. But one of them is allegory. And you're absolutely right. And isn't it interesting that, you know, you know Augustine and Paul and Calvin and Luther are the next step <laughs> in, our, uh, in our discussion here. So you're, you're anticipating uh, where we're going. Um, one of the things that, that theologians do, or even in Paul begins to do, and that is equates the faith of the church with the faith of Abraham. How is it that you become part of the covenant community? Well, Jews would say you follow the law of God, you follow the Torah that was given at Mount Sinai, right? Um, and first of all, I hope I'm not ignoring anybody because I can't see everyone, but, but please just unmute and jump in so I don't have to talk all the time. Um, you, you become part of the Jewish covenant by following the, the law itself, right? It's by uh, conforming the will of your individuality to the will of God. What Paul is going to do is say, no, 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 it is much more it, it, it precedes that in the, um, the history of salvation history. The way you become part of the covenant community is not by the works of following the law, but it's by the faith that was exhibited by Abraham. And Abraham believed God and it was attributed to him as righteousness. So we are saved by faith, you know, not by the law. So when and, you know, and being Calvinists and Presbyterians, we know this quite well. If we've, uh, you know, looked at Romans or we've looked at Augustine or if we've looked at John Calvin, uh, we, we know that salvation by grace through faith is the means by which all Christians are saved. And works of righteousness are an act of the will that comes through sanctification, right? Sanctification is the second act. Justification through grace is the first act. Nothing that we do. In fact, as Augustine pointed out, we are totally depraved. I mean, we are just like uh, 
you know, because of our original sin that comes through Adam, because of Adam's disobedience, we are completely incapable of offering up anything to God that God would, you know, in turn reward us for. It's not by anything we do because, you know, the good that I would do, says Paul, I cannot do. I'm completely incapable of doing it. So now you've got another possibility for the law to be shunted aside. Now the law comes to be interpreted as something that was just kind of a stopgap measure until Christ came along, right? How can you be righteous? Well, for those who lived in ignorance, they, they were, had to be given these laws to follow. But now that Christ has you know, suffered and died and has been resurrected, the law is no longer uh, valid. Now that's not true, that's, that's not good theology, but that comes to be the, the sense that people have. And so those who try to achieve salvation through works righteousness are in, in many ways um, equated with ignorant Jews, if I can use that without sounding derogatory. Jews who are ignorant of the true way to be righteous before God. Uh, this was Calvin. This was Luther. This is, though it never is really preached that much, you know, but I think there's a lot of anecdotal evidence to say that total depravity might not, <laughs> might not be so, uh, you know, misguided because it, there's certainly a lot, a lot of evidence that, you know, if given the opportunity, humans will make bad choices. But that is a way to, again, in Christian theology, to, to other the Jews. The Jews are the ones who are in their ignorance need a law, but we in our election and in the salvation that we have experienced in our baptism and, uh, and that comes through grace, we know that the law is not the means by which salvation comes into the world. Now, there were dissenting voices about this, and these are, interestingly, I, I think they're some of the most interesting theologians uh, in, in Christian history. The first of these was Pelagius. Uh, Pelagius was a British monk who many people who uh, believe that there is a so-called Celtic Christianity, that's, a, that's a, uh, an argument that some people have that there's, there's no Celtic Christianity, that's something that's been fabricated. But there is a sense of <clears throat> that comes from Pelagius that and, and also Irenaeus, there's no sense that we are born depraved, that, that God's creation is a creation that is good, and that the real problem isn't original sin, but is ignorance, right? And this is the, the theological question. Where does the real problem lie? Is it in dispelling ignorance or in, you know, through Christ's blood uh, masking the effects of total depravity uh, in, in, our, in our life. And Pelagius said it's ignorance, you know. God created a beautiful world. It's a good world. And, and all of us are, um, you know, free to make good choices. We just have to be led and directed through the spirit to make those good choices. Uh, Peter Abelard also in the 11th and 12th century, mostly the 12th century, very, very interesting uh, monk who uh, people, most people know about Abelard because of his love affair with a, a nun named Eloise. Uh, he was, I won't get into it, but it's a really interesting story. We can talk about it some other time. But uh, but he was also a very formidable uh, rhetorician who made these types of arguments that this world is, is good. You know, we should delight in this world. We should delight in the free will that God gives us and in the you know, um, ability for us to make good choices if led by the spirit of God. Because of this, Abelard was one of the early, early precursors of what would later become the enlightenment. And well, through the Renaissance and, and so on. Uh, this idea that, hey, human beings 
the world is a great place, you know. Um, but that allows for too much individuality within the context of the church. So you can understand why in Constantine's uh, empire, Augustine's theology would hold the day. These people are totally depraved. They need to be held at bay by the structures of our society. And it's a way to keep, you know, this is my Marxist reading. It's a way to keep people docile and, uh, you know, um, dependent upon the state. Um, anyway, uh, comment, comments about that before we move on. And if I'm speaking too fast, because I always want to get through this, um, it's unfortunate there was another that, that in the early, among the early church fathers, one of the great church fathers by the name of John Chrysostom, his, his name literally means golden mouth because he was such a wonderful preacher. <laughs> but uh, in 386 and 387, uh, using a, an extreme polemic that was popular at the time, he gave a series of sermons uh, against the Jews that would later become, you know what Luther's sermons were like, we talked about those two sessions ago, they would later become the blueprint really for what Martin Luther uh, would talk about. But we see this um, othering of the Jews in Christian art. And this is what I wanted to show you because um, Mikva refers to these you know, rather briefly and images of this would have been very helpful. But one thing I wanted to say about uh, Chrysostom before I move on is that he was somebody who did not allegorize. He was one of the first people to read the scripture looking at the plain meaning of the text. And he's recognized as one of the great interpreters of Paul. And this is why this icon, I've put it here, because here's Paul speaking into the ear of John Chrysostom. You know, this is what I meant. And so Chrysostom later becomes kind of the authority on what Paul meant. Uh, and, you know, the move goes from allegorizing narrative to reading Paul's rather straightforward letters to the Romans that do not need any allegorizing, right? And this only leads us down the road to what would later become uh, fundamentalism as we, as we know it. And that's a big statement I just made, but there are a number of steps along the way <laughs> that um, uh, will lead to this very, very literal reading of scripture. Um, any comments or questions about that? My Paul scholar is is Mac Martin. I don't know if you want to mention anything there, Mac. Well, um, I guess the one thing that, and I think this has been covered both by you and by her, uh, and and it was the point that you just concluded on. We got we get to literalism because. There was some there was some serious theological differences in the early church. I mean, yeah. they they believed some things like you know my old buddy and religion professor used to say you know Jesus is basically saying to the Jews of his time if you know according to the Gospels here have a ham sandwich, <laughs> you know the the law is not what we're going to be bound by. You know we're in a new world now. The the gospel writers. They were Jewish. They understood that. They wrote their gospels on that. They weren't that, I think their definition of fulfillment of prophecy is different than a Western definition. Right. But they right. saw the allegory that, that the type of thing that, that Dwight said, you know, that he's the new Moses. We've got the baby in the bulrushes, you know, basically that story mm -hmm. uh, and, and all of that. But when some of these, like in the Gospel of John, some of the anti-Jewish sentiments that are expressed, you know, you couldn't say that that was anti-Semitic because the people were Jewish themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, John and all of the, and his readers, the whole community, they were Jewish, but it was a religious difference. And at, in, I think about 90, about the same time this was written, the Jews had essentially excommunicated, correct, as correct. you mentioned, uh, from the synagogue, and so they were a little hosed at it. You know, they, <laughs> they weren't happy about it. 
But then the other th I think a, a very critical period of time here is that period of time between say, uh, you know, by about what, 110, some scholars might go 10, 20 years later, but the New Testament as we know it is basically written, right? Mm -hmm. So we've right. got a 200 and some year period of time before you get to the Council of Nicaea. And I think as our next, as somebody pointed out, you know, by that time, the Jewish mindset and approach and their perspective, it was better than Julius Caesar. Right. At that point, when the, when the doctrines are all developed. Hellenism. It's exactly, it's completely Hellenistic. And to your last point, part of that Hellenism is then where, when they read something, and they had the Old Testament, obviously, and they had the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But when they read it, their instinct is to read it literally. And now this is our next book, actually, is, uh, to, to, not to jump that gun, but uh, <laughs> you know they read it literally, right? And so then they develop these doctrines that you say, you know, the Trinity and whatever, you, you know, you recite. I recited part of the Creed and I see last Sunday, you know, and I always tell everybody, just remember, you're not under oath. <laughs> that's but, good. Uh, but you know, I think that that's a point that needs to be emphasized is that important period of time, that couple hundred years. Right. And the complete change in the perspective. Yeah. And this is when total depravity gets, you know, established. And, uh, you know, there were some like Irenaeus and Origen who were, who, you know, were leaning more towards, I guess, a more Jewish perspective of things. That's a hard thing to say. But, but for example, in terms of, you know, the goodness of creation and free will, uh, it wasn't set in stone until Augustine comes along and pretty much, you know, establishes it as such. Um, and we're left with, you know, a whole history after that. I wanted to thank you, by the way, Mac, because that's, that was a great uh, just overview of, you know, where we've been and what we've been talking about. Uh, Mikva mentions, and I just want to show you these, we'll start next time with this, that even in the art of the church, there was, uh, there were intimations, well, not, I don't even, they're not even intimations, there were very clear uh, references to replacement theology, that the church has now replaced, you know, Judaism as the, uh, the, as the, uh, true covenant community, the new Israel, the true Israel. Um, she mentions Strasbourg Cathedral. And given our time, I'll, I'll only show you these. But on the left, you have Ecclesia, the church, uh, carrying the, you know, the chalice of, of Christ's blood, looking uh, regal with the, with the crown, and uh, you know, carrying the, <laughs> the standard of the church, the cross. And on the right here, you, you can't see it very well, but it is synagoga, I guess, synagoga. I've never said that word, so I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. But looking downward, you know, um, and in a lot of these representations, she is blindfolded, representing the blindness of the Jews, the blindness of the Jews to the, the new covenant. Um, Here's another image. This is at uh, uh, Bamberg Cathedral in Germany, which if you've ever been there, has some of the most haunting uh, gargoyles and, and whatnot uh, that I've ever seen. Uh, there's one of the green man that just gives me nightmares <laughs> in my sleep. But this is, this is the image, speaking of allegory, of, of the synagogue uh, uh, with the blindfold over her eyes. She's been superseded by Ecclesia, the church. Um, another medieval image of Christ being nailed to the cross on the left, you have uh, Ecclesia, you know, with the crown taking the blood of Christ from his side as he's, you know, uh, 
speared by the Roman soldier. And on the right, you, you don't see it very well, but this is Synagoga turning away uh, and you can't see it here, but she has a goat's head in her hands representing the sacrifice of, uh, of the temple, which, you know, uh, it's assumed that Jews are still holding uh, true to, which is, is not the case so much anymore. Uh, but holding on to the Jewish Torah, uh, the books, and, and moving away from uh, the crucifixion, and it almost looks as if this person is, and I don't know who that would be, Maybe that's John, I'm not sure. I, I couldn't find much information on this, uh, on this folio or this, um, this image. It's probably part of a prayer book. Over here, another medieval image, the, the, the story of the 10, 10 virgins who five of whom keep their lamps trimmed and burning, whereas the other five, you know, allow themselves to fall asleep. So when the coming of the Messiah or the coming of the bridegroom, uh, they are found, uh, you know, in, in darkness and, and lacking in righteousness. Uh, another allegory for uh, the Jews and, um, and Christians. The, the bridesmaid here holding, you know, the light of Christ, wearing the crown, you know, carrying the chalice, uh, very, very interesting the way they uh, uh, portray that. One last image, though, and this is an image of hope. This is a reworking of the ecclesia and synagogue uh, images that you see in the older cathedrals from the Middle Ages. But this one is at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, and it was very recently um, christened by the Pope, and I think it was Francis who did this, but it is both women looking very much alike, both wearing diadems, crowns, one carrying the Jewish Torah, the other, you know, the, the Bible, the, the New Testament, uh, both looking toward each other, not away from each other, but almost indistinguishable when you look at their faces. Notice the lack of blindfold on synagogue here and the fact that they're almost twins. Uh, definitely a, a type of reconciliation and art that, you know, art uh, does not speak so much in literal terms, but, but you know, hits people in the soul. And uh, uh, this is a great, you know, uh, antidote, you might say, or a great response to uh, a thousand years of, of imagery that separated these two. So on that um, art historical note, I'll see if there are any comments or last words that people would like to have. Okay. Kathy, thanks for joining us from Tucson. Good to see you. Everyone, I will. Uh, leave Thanks, you everyone. Now. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. And thank I'll you. see you next time. Uh, we'll, we'll get into the chapter on Islam next time. So I think that's chapter 10 or so. So thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.